morning, everyone. Welcome to the IVS seminar. Again, we are continuing almost June, but we are still continuing. Today we have uh, an external speaker, Nikolai Brutovsky. Uh, he originally comes from uh, Ukraine, where he did his uh, master studies, and then he moved to Greece, I believe, for a uh, uh, four-year uh, PhD. Uh, and that was followed by uh, a postdoc uh, on Canary, Canary Islands in Tenerife, I think, because it was with uh, Sergio Simon Diaz, if I remember correctly. And since 2021, he is uh, in Belgium for the first two years in Liège and currently uh, in Brussels. Uh, so today he's going to speak about uh, rapidly rotating massive stars. The definition of massive here is spectral type OB. And he's going to connect that to the origin of the rotation of these stars. So the floor is yours, Nikolai. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. So microphone is working here, right? Uh, yeah, thanks for giving me this opportunity to present some of my ideas, which I'm still uh, thinking, are they good or not? Uh, so mainly, yeah, as I said, uh, as Andrew said, we will speak about um, rotation of uh, massive OB stars. And kind of, uh, I will approach this problem from different, you know, aspects. And uh, I was trying to understand, uh, will really existence of fast rotating stars especially give us something useful? I mean, for the understanding of all uh, physics, which is going on there. Uh, my conclusion will be like that so far. So, uh, but let's uh, yeah <laughs> discuss about it. Uh, why it's so complicated at this point, and why we still uh, could you know spend time more on this topic. So first, uh, let's start from definition. Uh, by fast rotating star, we will uh, consider any star with uh, projected. Uh, Mm, surface, surface equatorial velocity with more than 200 meters per second. Uh, that's kind of a historical reason. It's completely arbitrary. There is no uh, kind of a physical meaning, but uh, we will define this uh, oh, big, yeah, this uh, big tail of fast rotator with respect to the main peak of slow rotator, kind of as a fast rotating star. And the main question, uh, why, why do we have this picture? What is going on? And who is responsible for this tail, for existence of this tail? Uh, okay, in this uh, diagram, yeah, we work a lot on the Tenerife so for the um, yeah, last four years. And very important point here is that uh, this is, um, distribution reflects the VCNI of whole volume around us within three kiloparsecs. So there is no uh, restrictions in the age of star. I will show you later, it's very important. And uh, we do have a lot of young sterile clusters and uh, associations. So it's kind of, we took all volume around and measure their VCNI. Uh, it's in case of O-type star. In case of B-type star, uh, oh, sorry. The picture is uh, more or less the same. Apart from the, uh, there is one uh, just small difference that uh, in this study, uh, yeah, authors also measure the VCNI of the spectroscopic binaries and mainly of the first component spectroscopic binaries. So maybe even I don't remember exactly, maybe two components also included, but I think not. Uh, the picture is relatively the same, apart from the very small difference uh, in the main peak among slow, in the slow rotator domain, mainly because uh, the tidal interaction. It's one of the kind of hint that there is some synchronization going on. That's why we have a small shift. It's one of the explanation. And if we will uh, go uh, from to the less luminous domain, mainly to the B-type stars, to the less massive. Mm. Picture is uh, completely different. Uh, we have a B-model distribution of VCNI. Mm. And by the way, for the same uh, galaxy, this is for the uh, large, large Magellanic cloud. Uh, 
So we don't have any more uh, tail of astrotator. We have a kind of uh, two peaks, even uh, you know by excluding uh, the BE uh, type of star, which uh, presumably have a decretion disk around. And kind of this is a question, kind of why we do have um, such difference. Mm. So at this point, we arrived. Ah, and also I forgot that apart from the SMC, also we have similar studies in the, um, apart from LMC, we have the similar studies in the small multigenic cloud where the B-type star have more or less the same behavior. The Vicina distribution now has more the same behavior. Uh, and the H, by the way, is kind of for this cluster is, I mean, it's relatively, for me, it's a relatively old cluster. Okay, at this stage, we have all rights to ask uh, questions why, I mean, fast rotating star exists. Uh, here I listed uh, four main hmm, reasons, like physical reasons, why it could happen. I mean, uh, they're more or less, uh, I mean, they're connected with each other, but it you know, depends, but I mean, how we want to connect them. But also we can ask other questions, why, um, slow rotating star exists. I mean, it's from the different, I mean, we are, we are right to do that. Uh, there is just one small difference that, uh, sure, mass, we not expect any uh, effect of mass accretion on the um, appearance of slow rotating star, but we do have uh, two additional uh, effect that could uh, spin down its uh, magnetic breaking and the mass loss within the evolution of our uh, objects. Um, and uh, ideally we need to evaluate all of these um, reasons to understand, I mean, uh, do I mean, can we really um, reproduce our VCNI distribution for a given population of the star? Uh, I thought to really to go one by one, but I understood that later why it's so complex, but uh, I'm pretty convinced that with merging scenario we can exclude, uh, I mean, we can exclude that mergers can produce fast rotating stars because we have already, I mean, a very recent paper about uh, one magnetic star, one, yeah, 148, um, uh, 947, so it's a magnetic star, it's merged, and uh, according to uh, not so numerous theoretical predictions, I would say just one, but maybe there are more, uh, because of the magnetism which uh, uh, are um, kind of happening uh, with a merger effect, this magnetic breaking immediately spin down the star, so we will not have uh, a fast rotating as a result of major interaction. So at this point, uh, I mean, merging scenario is connected with magnetic breaking and for sh I mean, I'm pretty convinced, maybe it's, I'm uh, a bit brave to say that, I mean, uh, merging of two stars will not produce a, a fast rotator. Uh, then, mm, if we really will start to think on which parameters each of the rest of the reasons are, I mean, for which parameters uh, all these points are, I mean, connect with each other. I mean, how they really, what is the physical parameters are involved in each of the, mm -hmm. of these reasons. Uh, it's a mess, really, because here I listed just the main, mm -hmm points and really we can't distinguish anymore uh, how we can produce a slow or fast rotating star. And at this point it's better to do like that. Let's start from the basic uh, kind of effect that really doable at this point to model in order to reproduce of what we see in the VCNI. And this two effect is just we need to constrain H and initial mass of a given population of star and to see what is happening there and that's it. Because the rest will come 
after, but at least we need to reproduce our rotation within a given age of the star and initial mass. That's it. Mm. To do so, if we have if this goal, we need to go to the HR diagram because we need to see <laughs> where all these uh, fast rotators are uh, locating on it. So this is again our uh, Jacob sample uh, of O-type uh, stars and on the HR diagram. And uh, okay, on, we can see that they they are all close to the zero H main sequence. They have s uh, small spread in their ages. And here is a, again, as I mentioned, we don't know the actual age of any of the star because we can, of course, fit it to the evolutionary track, but uh, <laughs> it can be a tricky. I mean, are they coming from the same cluster or not? And uh, here we have uh, I mean, very good that we have one cluster which we can really um, look, I mean, I mean, first of all, this cluster has a lot of OB stars and, with, and very bright stars. So we really can measure the VCNI of each of the OB stars there. Uh, yeah. And uh, this cluster is NGC 2244, and this is a two isochron, which correspond to this H, so because we know the H of this cluster. And uh, among all our sample, we have uh, four stars, which really uh, aligned with one isochron of two million year. And I mean, that's kind of what we expect. Uh, we have two fast rotator and two slow rotators. But we would like to have more. And also, we kind of don't know uh, as they kind of were born like that or not. Uh, okay. There is, uh, so we have there more or less 40 stars. I didn't plot them on the HR diagram. I will uh, tell you later why. But we were able already to measure their um, uh, the nice. And we can see that picture is slightly different of what we have uh, respect to the whole volume of the O-type star. Um, the population of fast rotating star is twice bigger as in the whole volume, and it already means something that if we really make this constraint in the age, that, okay, if we will measure the rotation velocity of the all O-type star, and here I didn't clean them yet, maybe there are some B-type star, but uh, I'm not expect so many B-type stars. It's really preliminary result. And it's already saying uh, as something that, uh, okay, Maybe it's really uh, primord primor primordial fast rotation that the stars were born like, uh, I mean, fast already. And then if we, of course, uh, will look to the stars with, I mean, which are a bit older, more evolved, they will spoon down to the uh, kind of uh, our main peak of slow rotator. Uh, so it's very promising result. So if we will really make carefully a new VCN distribution for this given cluster, it will be a very, I mean, it will give us a lot of insights. And apart from that, yeah, it's, sorry. Ah. Uh, it will also help us, I mean, since uh, if we will concentrate in one mass uh, region, uh, I mean, all type star will, I mean, systematically be more massive. So if uh, really, I mean, we will say that we have not double, but a significant peak among very young O-type star close to the zero, zero H main sequence. That can also give us a hint why we don't have it uh, among B-type star, where, I mean, because in this study, there are no uh, blue supergiants, so it's just a dwarf. So the mass uh, of stars, which are shown here, is between, I don't know, for sure not more than 15, but I'm, I don't remember the minimum uh, limit of the mass, but yeah, not less than eight or seven, that's for sure. Uh, 
And what it can explain us? So maybe uh, we don't have a tail fast rotator uh, of fast rotators. We really do have a bimodal distribution in the O type and B type, but uh, the difference uh, between these two domains is that uh, because of the wind, uh, the B type star were, I mean, not that uh, they were not spinning down so quickly as in O type star. Yeah. Because, I mean, if we have a really massive star because of the wind and depends on the different angular moment prescription, uh, surf surface rotation velocity uh, within main sequence duration can drop significantly. I mean, this is one of the tests I played, but it's just for one uh, 24 solar mass star. Okay, I was a bit lazy to play, I mean, because you need to really need to play with a grid to, to disc, uh, investigate the whole range of masses, but still, I mean, we can see that uh, uh, it's very, uh, I mean, at the end of the main sequence, because it's still the end of the main sequence is showing the tracks, uh, we can decrease by, I mean, twice we can decrease the rotational velocity if we were uh, in the fast rotation regime initially. And if, uh, I mean, for the less massive star, it can really last longer. So we can, be, even at the end of the main sequence, we can um, rotate fast as we've been born. So it's one of my speculations. And for this, we again need to study the isolated clusters, which is kind of difficult in, to do in reality. Okay, another point what I wanted to ask. Uh, for the theoreticians, I mean, uh, when you're saying to them uh, what is a fast rotator star, they say that it's everything what is more than of zero point of critical, it's a fast rotating star, but it's not for the us observers. Uh, it's just different terms and it's kind of interesting to see that uh, uh, if we will put there, uh, we will if we will mark their stars with a uh, critical rotation more than more than 0 0.5, which are really in the very very high uh, regime of rotation. So f f we don't have any, I mean, super massive type star, which makes sense. I would expect it because of their size and really a very fast mm, spinning down because of the wind. But also uh, how to distinguish here in this mm, case, we should not forget maybe they are re rejuvenated. We didn't speak much yet about the mass uh, transfactor, mass transfer factor in all this game, but if really all the star were it's just uh, rejuvenated after mass transfer. And how to distinguish these two populations is also a bit trick. And that's kind of our, I mean, one of our tasks as well. So that's why we should be really careful here. And we need to have some diagnostic tool to really distinguish who, I mean, which star were born uh, fast and who were get the angular momentum because of mass transfer. And then it gets rejuvenated and again appeared close to the zero ma uh, H main sequence. Yeah, because uh, here's one of the simulation, yeah, just what I uh, mm, uh, just said, that, uh, okay, but it's in terms of the color mode diagram, but okay, more or less it rep represents the same evolutionary stage of the star. Uh, that, yeah, uh, we do expect uh, have a bunch of stars after mass trans after the mass transfer with uh, rotational velocity more than yeah, 0 0.5 of degree. So that's kind of area where we need to really be careful with post interacting objects. And very also uh, good to see that all uh, stragglers, all you know, merging products have a slow rotation. So again, that's, that's what I said at the beginning that we will not expect much uh, merger product to be a fast rotating star. Okay, to do so, uh, we need to investigate uh, star by star in, uh, in this 
in all our, I mean, sample to, and to find what is a diagnostic tool would be to understand who suffered mass transfer, who is not. And usually uh, we need to look to the abundances. We would expect uh, enrichment, especially in the nitrogen, if there is mass transfer uh, pass, um, we would expect a nitrogen enriched, especially in the case if we are uh, locating near the zero H main sequence. And again, this is all our, I just cut it the slow rotator in our sample, just showing the fast rotators in terms of peak to peak velocity because we had the multi-epoch data. So if we want to find the binaries or hidden binaries, we need to understand what is their variations with radial velocity because maybe there is something <laughs> you know, nearby which we are curious in. And if we will transform uh, this diagram in terms of, again, v-critical, we can see that uh, mm, yeah, half of our sample is simply a slow rotator and half is a fast rotator. And yeah, here is just uh, one note which we need to be careful if that maybe what we measure as VCNI and all other physical parameters are not that right because because of the really deformation of the star, because of the high rotation, maybe we most of the flux coming from the pole of the star. So maybe we underestimate even VCNI there. And but uh, there is one or uh, I mean you know him very well who's working this topic. And it will really help us if we will really model what is the effect of the rotation on the, I mean, appeared parameters which were measured and maybe it's even more than three sigma of variation. So that we need to take into account because then position on this diagram of all the star will shift and also abundances will also be different. So that's why we need to be careful about it. Oh, okay. Uh, then, um, in order to see really uh, how much all our stars are enriched, we need to place them on the classical CNL diagram. So, and we can see very easily here uh, main path uh, while the star is evolving through, uh, evolving through the main sequence. So we expect that, uh, so I just put one of the track, track for a 50 solar mass star because it will be more enriched in terms of uh, nitrogen and in terms of nitrogen, yeah, because carbon and oxygen will be depleted. And uh, we can see that we have a branch of very nitrogen rich star. And if the, we will look the, uh, on them on the, HR diagram, they are really close to the zero H main sequence. While we expect that this is the end of the main sequence. So it's already a disagreement, but it's a bit uh, dangerous game because enrichment can uh, depend on a lot of parameters. I'm not an expert here. I know that we could vary a lot of parameters in our codes. But still, I'm not believing that we could, with a single evolutionary track, to have uh, this enrichment of nitrogen at the beginning. It, especially if we know the cluster where they're locating. So that uh, still we need to, of course, to check it carefully. But these are the first candidates to be a post-interacting star. Yeah, that's uh, what I just uh, showed because uh, yeah, we have a branch of uh, normal nit nitrogen and some of them are very ni nitrogen enriched. So that's why, and again, it's uh, even a given volume. It's not one cluster. That's why we need to go to the one cluster where we for sure know the age. And if we will follow the one isochron and the one age on this diagram, then that's it. We will be kind of mm, understand, first of all, the initial rotation dip, dip distribution. Okay. 
just to sum up a bit. Um, so this is a kind of uh, how we proceed before uh, to investigate all this VCNI distribution in the different domains. Uh, as we did uh, in the Jacob database, it's just we have a different uh, one volume environment and then just to measure everything. But we don't know the age and we don't know the who is post and pre-interacting object. Uh, that's why to look on the binaries kind of help us because if we will notify post interacting uh, pre-interacting object, it will already give us uh, kind of hint that okay this star didn't uh, suffer much of the you know any interaction so it represents the actual rotation and then uh, we can also go one by one and investigate for example their abundances but it's really cost a lot because we really need to um, Usually people are doing, I mean, one star is one paper. So it's a huge amount of work to really understand the actual evolutionary stat status uh, one uh, in among I mean, this domain. Okay, so uh, what uh, I propose to do here. First, just concentrate on the cluster for which we know the uh, actual age and they well kind of, the age is well constrained. So we do have, I already showed a preliminary result regarding uh, NGC 2244, but we have also two other, uh, two other clusters, which are uh, quite young. They're uh, not more than 10 million years. So in this case, we will really follow the isochron and we will really see how, uh, I mean, how the VCNI distribution is changing through the time. That's I, I, ideal, but we also, need to be careful which mass regime we are dealing with because I mean who needs this first of all <laughs> it's uh, people who are working on the star formation processes because we do have kind of uh, one uh, assumption which kind of we uh, we are taking as classical okay I, any massive star is initially I mean uh, has a initial rotation of 0 0.5 of critical and that's it but it's kind of also we don't know for sure is it true or not so if we will measure everything close to the zero h mean sequence uh, we will really we will see really the picture and um, also it will help uh, understand us how the massive stars are forming because there are a lot of uh, physical process even before star Mm, were born are happening because, for example, be after the, I mean, while uh, all the material accreted, what is the, um, I mean, angular momentum transport there? And do they have any sources of uh, evacuating this angular momentum? And also, if we will uh, divide it by different uh, mass regime, uh, it's also very kind of, would be interesting to see do we have any correlation uh, do we have a mostly radiative or convective star because in the, uh, it's much more easier in terms of um, mostly convective star so with a uh, star with a lower mass so they're kind of the angular moment, momentum redistribution appears there much more easier uh, so we do have some works on the star formation of Mm. Uh, low mass star but we don't have any guess uh, in the what is going on in the radiative envelope and where we have a very huge radiative envelope and this, uh, this point belongs yeah to the last one which is so we don't know if we observe a fast rotating star uh, uh, does the star rotate fast uh, just on the surface or is the all star rotates fast because it's also will, will affect a lot our understanding I mean what is the actual physics and it will because if if we will uh, have at least some constraints here it will help us significantly in our understanding of uh, post-interaction uh, 
physics because there we also have a lot of uncertainties and I mean it will help us maybe we should not look for the fast rotating star as a post interacting object but it's also a bit nice speculation and uh, as the last but okay maybe it's not the last it depends on our time uh, why will be extremely difficult to get this point is because to plot all the stars on the HR diagram will be very difficult because two weeks ago I was on the Mercator and I observed uh, many of the stars in this cluster and when you look in which environment this star are locating uh, it's a mass with extinction it will be extremely difficult to get a real luminosity there because for each star we will need to measure extinction because as you can see the, uh, the cluster is extremely crowded and, and it's very young within two million years of course we have still a lot of gas around so that kind of my main point how many minutes we have okay, okay just uh, also what i want to emphasize is uh, a question about the tides it's from my latest uh, work yeah mm. regarding the radiative and uh, uh, convective uh, zones in the massive star uh, uh, what we find out and why it's also important to understand if in which uh, mass regime we are dealing with is that uh, really the physics of tides in um, convective core and the radiative envelope is different so the a2 is so-called this patient coefficient for our calculation of time synchronization within uh, tidal uh, time synchronization and just one warning which we find out that uh, for massive stars the uh, usual uh, prescription which we think in the mass is not very good working let's say in this way because it just depends on the whole mass of the star uh, while there isn't going work in the other um, evolutionary code poseidon where uh, they look on the different tides which are happening uh, in these two regions and, and it really depends on the convective uh, the size of the convective core and uh, because of this different physics uh, synchronization time is in tides and it will also affect a lot i will show you later here is one order difference just because of, uh, we apply a different coefficients uh, and what is happening uh, that if we will look uh, how tidal interaction affecting the rotation velocity of extreme uh, mass ratio stars that these two prescriptions are kind of really showing us a different result not the, on the beginning of the main sequence but if we will really increase the mass ratio because it's ex i mean here is a very um, small secondary companion but if we will really increase uh, our mass ratio it will have a really significant difference so that's why uh, kind of it is important uh, with to understand the interiors and it's also connect with uh, what i just said before because if we will e introduce the binary interaction in the whole sni distribution and as I said, of course, it will move a bit uh, the peak because of synchronization. So that another my takeaway messages. So I think, yeah, I will stop here, and I open yes to the discussion. Thanks, uh, Nikolai, for this uh, nice talk. Um, we have plenty of time for questions wants to start yeah I know. Uh, thanks Nikolai for the nice talk um, on this slide and also on a previous one with the surface rotation mass loss um, at ZAMS 
I actually, you can actually just show that one. Uh, at Zams, you have this spike. So you've initialized the star, and then it, uh, it sort of jitters around the velocity. What's happening there? Yeah. This one. Yeah, at the very beginning, you initialize it to some value, but then yeah, it, it seems to have to relax. What's sequence, happening there? It's a mass uh, readjustment of the star. What needs to be readjusted there? Is this maybe something that's indicative of, of the physics we need to be accounting for? Uh, I think then, the, uh, I mean, we, I think once we, st I think it's completely numerical. I think it's, because also if we start the model there, it's making a small loop. I, did, I think I just didn't cut it when the actual zero h main sequence but is it, is it solid body and then it's relaxing to something that isn't solid body rotation? No, no, kind of people assume it's like relaxation of the whole, uh, yeah. Okay. So I don't know the actual, what is the, from the okay. American point of view is going on there. Okay. But even if you, yeah, I didn't cut it here, but on the HR diagram, it will make a small loop before the zero H main sequence. So. Okay. But it's very, you know, internal mess of thing. Yeah, I think I can confirm this point that is this indeed just the equilibrium of the star that needs to be found because you spin the star up as as you numerically initiate the the, the rotation of this thing, then it needs to find its new thermal and hydrostatic equilibrium. So so that's that. Yeah, but it's not star no, it's not pre main sequence. It's just just a few moments before. I think it's how. Uh, That's the whole point. So you you start computing your model from the sums, basically. So you d you do not compute pre main sequence here. If yeah, you were to compute it, then, yeah. then you wouldn't no, see no, that. No, uh, yeah. But I will not consider it as a ZAMS, so it comes a bit later, it's just a few moments later. Yes, uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I had a few questions actually, and since we had some time, I'm gonna <laughs> ask it. First, actually, a follow up question uh, on this plot, which uh, it's very interesting. What's, uh, what's actually causing this drastic drop there at the end of the main sequence or the post-main sequence in these models? Do you know that? The Wink uh, mass loss rate. Okay. Just, yeah, it's so it's so that, jump, yeah. we need to get rid of. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So they're not actually going over to the red supergiant. Absolutely not. It's the end of the main sequence. This is just the end of the main sequence. Yes. Okay, so this is actually the bistability. Okay, yeah, it's very interesting. I, there is an interesting talk about but, that. Uh, as we can <laughs> see, yeah. <laughs> From two weeks ago, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, okay, uh, that was a nice confirmation. Then I had, uh, you said in passing that you start typically with like a V rotation of a V critical of 0 0.5 uh, in one of your slides, and that you could get a better estimate on that. It's a... No, I, I mean, when you start off your standard models, I guess. When you said, I mean, what could we do uh, if you go a few slides further? Uh, yeah, you can just... No, no, no. It's no, it's actually a bit... No, it's other way. Uh, it's, uh, here. Yeah, here. Can yeah. we get more meaningful assumption of initial? Uh, I, can you clarify what you mean? Then uh, uh, of initial v rotation over v critical than 0.5. What 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 do you what do you mean? <laughs> no, when we are speaking with, uh, when I was speaking with some th <laughs> theoreticians, they saying, okay, let's assume 0 0.5 is our uh, initial rotation rate. No matter what and where it comes from, I don't remember exactly. But even in Geneva model, it's 0 0.4 or something. No, I was just wondering where it comes from. I think uh, <laughs> completely arbitrary. Yeah. But it's kind of what people are usually saying. It should be rotate fast. 0 0.5 is... Uh, because you're looking at a very interesting sample of fast rotators, right? But it seems from the distributions, I mean, most of them are actually quite slow. Yeah. It seems. So, I, yeah. And, 
yeah, that's a thing uh, that half of our uh, uh, stars are slow rotator, yeah. according to the, you know, <laughs> if you want to make some any theoretical prediction of after mass mm, transfer. Yeah. But because uh, for observers, also it's very difficult to get the actual radii. That's why sure. not, it's very difficult to get it for observation of course, sample. Of because course. the radii will start. Of course, of course. Also, I didn't put the error bar here, real, but... No, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> uh, and then I had a small final, if I may. Yes, and that was when you talked about the magnetic fields. Uh, you said that they spin down uh, very rapidly. Uh, but actually, when you look at this star, yeah, the HD148937, there is an issue because when you do the magnetic braking analysis, it actually predicts a spin on town significantly longer that seems to be the age of the neb surrounding nebula. Um, I don't know if that's something that you have uh, considered. So I consider just interpret as a global interpretation. Sorry? Yeah, I just consider it as a global interpretation because according to Fabian simulation, it's yeah. very fast. It is very fast, it's right? Very... Yeah, but... Is it angular momentum loss in Just the merger itself? Momentum. Yeah. But then, then I have the follow-up question, because if you look at magnetic B stars, they're actually rotating fast normally. The B type. Yeah. Uh, That's something that... Sorry, it's a little bit perhaps uh, uh, besides the... But since you made the... the yeah. yeah, for example, of course. But, yeah, but the magnetic B stars, actually. They're typically rotating uh, quite fast. So I was just wondering about that since you said, uh, but it's, the answer is that it's actually in the merger itself that it's predicted to, to, to already spin down. So not. Yeah, because not readjustment of all, if you have two cores, hmm. then yeah, to readjustment the whole momentum okay. to the one star, it will yeah. be difficult. But, uh, I suppose yeah, also yeah, magnetic no. braking is significant. But yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Because we are on this slide, what makes the difference between the rotation distribution of the B stars and that of the O stars? Because the B, B star model distribution and the B types. The B star distribution. We don't have. Um, we don't have a clear of slow rotator, no, if we will. Yeah, but for example, I mean, to me, it looks flat it within error bars. Yeah. If you do a test, it looks flat within error bars. Uh, but the O star, which are only a factor 50% in mass larger, right, typically, because those B stars are A to 15, and the O stars, typically, they are 15 to 30, because after that, the IMF tells you that you don't find many, so they don't impact your distribution. The Ostans have a clear low velocity peak for 80% of the sample yeah. at around 100 km per second, 80 km per second. While the B stars, it seems to be flat between 0 and 300 km per second. Why? I would nearly uh, explain it by uh, really mm, not that significant mass loss within. Uh, but the mass loss needs time to spin down, right? Yep. But uh, as I said, if we will take in the like 24 solar mass, if we have a really high rotation, like if we will start uh, yeah, at 300, yeah, 300 for the O type star, it will go directly to spinning down to the slow rotation. But slowly, right? I mean, you had this plot, it takes millions of years to have a significant decrease of velocities. And what is the <laughs> age of this B type star? Well, in the LMC, it's more complicated, but if you look at the... Uh, oh, even here also. If you look at the NGC 6231, which is 5 million years old, you get the same distribution. It's flat between 0 and 300 for the B stars. But are they... Uh, I, I don't know the answer. I'm just a pro. No, <laughs> nobody knows the answer. I, I would... Uh, yeah, because by evolu evaluating all this... Um, angular momentum transfer plus mass loss prescription that, yeah, it's just different regimes, I mean, different speed of spinning down. In five million years, none of those have time to spin down, significantly, right? You can spin down 20%, but 
you don't go from 300 to zero. Yeah, I, I would repeat the same uh, plot, as I said, for one star, I would repeat <laughs> all the simulations for the B-type star and to see. But of course, yeah, that's kind of why, I know. We still have time for questions, Alex. Uh, hi. Um, I just wanted to make sure I understood correctly on the merging stars. Um, so you outruled it very early. Uh, I gather that's entirely due to the simulations of Schneider and company. So that's like there is no observational uh, piece of this. It's it's purely based on those observations. Oh, sorry, they're, on they're the models, right? Star, yeah. yeah. So this so that was entirely due to those that modeling group's uh, models, or was there something else that factored into that decision? I was just wondering. No, we just have uh, more, I think, yeah, we have just one simulation, very good simulation by yes. Fabian, but observationally, we can, for example, claim that for a given cluster, we have blue struggles, yeah? If they came really from, as a, from the, the, if they are really a merger product, well, blue stragglers could also just be some other post-mass transfer product, right? It doesn't, yep. they're, they're somewhat agnostic to how the mass gets transferred. Right. But um, I was just, I just wanted to confirm my understanding that that conclusion of outruling the mergers was indeed purely uh, dependent on those models as opposed to some combination well, it's just of just a pure model so far. And of course, yeah, okay. uh, it's a bit speculative. But of course, of course. To have a really, really uh, bona fide merger star, okay, we can, yeah. we can do it as a blue straggler, yeah. But yeah. as they really rotate fast. Because I might, I'm, I'm not an expert in these kinds of models, but I might imagine that if you play around with the physics enough, the ratio of the orbital angular momentum that ends up in, for example, your envelope versus what is lost to the system entirely, it doesn't seem unreasonable for me to me that that could change. But I mean, it's still early days, right? These are a relatively new kind of model and so on. Mm -hmm. But is there any feature in the observations that you might expect to see if, for example, mergers were playing a significant role, for example, early on, you showed a plot showing primaries versus singles. A post-merger product will obviously not appear as a primary because it has no companion. So would I expect to see some sort of discrepancy or would that be completely washed out in these kinds of plots? Yeah, but for this, we need really a magnetic. We expect that merger products will have mag strong magnetic field or at least some magnetic field and we don't have mm -hmm. much magnetic stars there. Plus, we need to go, uh, I think, only one way, just to go to the cluster and to see the population of blue struggle. Then, okay, okay. and then measure their velocity. If I answer your question, it's just not that yeah, well, right. <laughs> well uh, explored, I guess. Yeah. So you'd say looking at the magnetic stars and comparing those populations observationally yeah. would be the uh, But we approach, just have perhaps. a few, uh, we have just 10% of all the massive stars to be magnetic, so we don't have many much, a uh, big sample of stars to study. Ah, uh, I see, so yeah, uh, at most It's a very rare stars. thing among my circle type stars. Okay, thanks. All right, still time for questions. Are there are any? Well, people are thinking, uh, I think I'll have a comment and, uh, and a quick question. So the comment is uh, on the point of differentiality, right? So core to surface rotation, uh, whether the stars tend to rotate uh, rigidly or differentially. Mm -hmm. We do have some evidence from seismology that it's uh, more uh, of a uniform, so rigid rotation. Um, the evidence is a bit stronger for F stars than for B stars, but still. Uh, I guess my question would be, how strong level of differentiality should be for you to really start to care about it? Is this like five, ten percent, fifty percent? Differentiality mean in the interior of stars. Yes, the radio, in the radial direction. Well, first of all, how to detect it in such high mass uh, region? Uh, and so we, ex in the stratosphere, I guess you just see the frequencies here. Yeah? Yeah, so you, 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 can me you can measure the uh, differentiality in the radial yeah. direction in late B stars, so early B and O stars is currently impossible, yeah. but uh, late B, that's doable. 
Yeah, I didn't think about what uh, what should be the difference on the surface and the interior in terms of the rotation. Yeah, this I think. Yeah, it's to, okay. Just good to know. Yes, also it's a powerful tool for understand uh, the star rejuvenated or not because then we will see a bigger convective core. So that's why how people are using astro seismology in this case. To, mm. If we will able to see any rejuvenation by it. If we will uh, see any signatures of rejuvenation of after a post mass transfer from yes. the astro seismology, if we will have some peculiarity in this. So well, there is some research done on, on that front in the group of Fabian Schneider, uh, I believe. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Comments? If not, let's uh, thank the speaker again. And thank you guys uh, for coming. Uh, see you next week.